Amen. Thank you, Miss Janet, once more. And, uh, and let me welcome you to our midweek Bible study. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit different. This is the very first day of December, and, uh, and it's the month that we begin to, to focus our attention toward Christmas, a time when we celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I have asked our Director of Missions, uh, Ernest DeSoto, once more uh, to come and to share with us. And, uh, and as he and I talked about things, we talked about a very familiar passage in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 where it presents some of the names that were prophesied about who Jesus Christ was, who he was coming to be in our world. And so for the next uh, four weeks, we're going to plan on giving him an opportunity to just kind of unpack this verse and these various names of Christ. But as we get started today, let's thank him for this day and this season, and let's pray together. Father God, again, I come and I thank you for this opportunity. Father, even online, to be able to connect together as your people. And Father, I thank you that, God, even though we may be recording things ahead of time and people may be watching it at various times, there's that real sense that, God, when we come together to, to focus our attention on you, we are together in your presence. And Lord, I pray that through uh, this study, through this time that we share each week, that people are encouraged both through your word, through your presence, through your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for this month, and we thank you for the opportunity we have to celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ into this world. And God, I pray we would come to understand better who Jesus has come to be, not just in the world, but who he is in our life in these days. We pray blessing on this study as Brother Ernest shares it today. We pray you minister to the needs of your people, God, through your word and through this time together. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. And normally at this time, before our study, we have someone to come and share uh, a special. And uh, this morning, uh, you're stuck with me. And, uh, and I just want to share with you a, a Christmas carol that uh, was on my mind and my heart as we think about celebrating what Christmas is about at this time of year. Yeah. 
shall come to this time that we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I pray through this study we have a greater understanding of who he has come to be and who he desires to be in our life as Brother Ernest shares with us in these days. Thank you, Pastor. It is good to be with you again, and I thank you so much for joining us this uh, morning or wherever you're at, wherever you're watching and uh, those that are here in the church. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and speak during this season. Who would have thought a year ago that we would be um, sort of bound by doing some of the things that we're doing, and yet at the same time we're still able to get the word out. Uh, all through my lifetime, this is the time of year where choirs and drama teams and uh, the decorations are all up, and we're preparing to see visually enacted in so many different ways, children's groups, uh, youth groups, and choirs, the story of the coming of Jesus. And yet, uh, so many are not able to do that. So many of our choirs and uh, groups are not able to meet. And yet, really, it, it is about a story. Uh, in fact, I love that song that the pastor picked out because it's sort of that Hebrew, uh, Israeli feel of, um, expectancy Lord what are you going to do in this day and we're waiting for you which for century after century they were longing for the coming of the Messiah and so I want to speak in the next four Wednesdays out of the book of Isaiah and you may not have read a whole lot of that lately but I, I'm going to be in chapter 9 and uh, specifically chapter 9 verse 6 is going to be our focus but I'm going to begin reading today in chapter 8 and verse 19. Uh, today I want to give you a little bit of background and then I want to talk about one of the titles of uh, Jesus, the, one of the titles of the prophet uh, that, that he gives us here for, for Jesus. And so I want to talk about the time of the prophecy and then I want to talk about the tenses of prophecy in general because I want to remind you that uh, some of the things the prophet talked about applied to their contemporaneous setting, to their day. Some of the things they talked about apply to the day that Christ came or his first coming. Some talk about the coming, the second coming. And still even more, it applies to all of us in all times, even today for us. And then I want to focus on those titles. So let me talk a little bit about the times of the prophet. Let's look at chapter 8, verse 19. And when they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Now this is the background of our chapter here because you have a group of people whom uh, God had brought uh, and God had spoken to out of all the people of the earth. He selected Abraham and said, I'm going to bless all the nations of the world through you. And then of course they wound up in captivity in Egypt, but God brought them out, gave them his law, gave them a land, and was preparing to, for them to be the light of the world, and they began to do what human, fallen humans do, and they began to turn away from his word, and they began to do what the world does. And so they, like others around them, began to consult anything else but the law and the truth of God. And so the question, it begs itself, uh, should not a good people consult their God? Or should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. So here is the emergence of this theme of people who should be the light of the world uh, that are in darkness. And they will pass through the land and hard-pressed and famished, 
And it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse the king and the God they face upward. Then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. But there will be no more gloom for her who is in anger, anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephetili with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Thou shalt multiply the nation. Thou shalt increase their gladness. There will be glad in the presence, in thy presence, and with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou will break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. Something's changed, something's turned here. And in verse 6, we're, we find out what it is. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government of peace or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. I don't know how much of the book of Isaiah you have read lately and, and how much of an understanding you have about the book of Isaiah. But I want to talk for a moment about the time of the prophet who lived around eight, uh, seven or eight centuries before the time of Christ. He lived at a time before what was a divided nation fell. And uh, it was in the process of, of being destroyed. You remember the nation of Israel divided in two. There were ten northern tribes called Israel and two southern tribes called Judah. And so he was prophesying judgment not only upon Israel for their actions and rebellion against God, but he was also pronouncing judgments upon the surrounding nations and their role, and then ultimately judgment on all, all humanity in their fallen state. And so we know that the Assyrians in the year 722 destroyed uh, the ten northern tribes, and then later on the Babylonians in 586 would conquer the remainder and haul off God's people in uh, deport them into a foreign land. And so Isaiah was writing at a time of distress, Isaiah was writing at a time where the people of God were saying, Lord, what are you up to? I thought we were your chosen people. I thought you were going to use us. Uh, to, I thought you, we were your favored. And they were wondering, God, whatever you're going to do, get on with it. Uh, I remember when I was a pastor and my kids were really young. My daughter uh, was about uh, five or six. She was in preschool. And so we had Sunday night church. And so we got to the end of the service and we had the invitation time. And so my daughter stepped out during the invitation time. She was four or five, and, and I've, I've seen young children who have come to Christ, but uh, I thought, well, this is it. She, my daughter's ready to accept a Savior. So she came, walked down the aisle, and I kneeled down before her, as I do with children, and I said, honey, what, what is going on? And she looked at me, and she said, Dad, when this is all over with, can we go to Chuck E. Cheese? Uh, she was ready to get on with what she wanted. She was ready to, she had her plans. In spite of what was going on at that moment. And, you know, Israel was saying, God, uh, you know, we don't know what you're up to, but this is sure uncomfortable. We don't like being destroyed. We don't like being hauled off. It's interesting that when Isaiah wrote this, again, uh, he, he was writing it. And, and, and the whole book, all, all 66 chapters, it's like you would take a modern-day pastor and just sort of compile all his sermons together and, and organize them. All of these are inspired by the Holy Spirit, are part of the Word of God. It's interesting how they apply to the different nations around them. And so at the same time, during the time 
that the prophet was, was preaching and was teaching. It was an amazing time in his life. If you go back and review it, you remember Isaiah 6 is where he sort of got caught up in the temple and was in the presence of a holy God and, and God called him to be a spokesman and said, who will go for me? And Isaiah said, I'll go, I'll be the one. And so during this time, he was God's anointed person to share the truth of what God was about to do. And so being a prophet, I want to talk next about the tenses, not the tension, but the tenses, because many of the words of the prophet, when you go back and read them, that's why it's important to understand the historical setting, because you have the past, you have the present, you got the future. And so uh, when a prophet speaks, it's kind of like uh, these days when I go outside and I look outside and boy, it was, it was cold last night. The sky was, I understand that when the sky is clear and it's this time of the year, the temperature just plummets. And so, but one of the things that's interesting that I've noticed that over the course of my nearly 60 years is all of a sudden I begin to recognize uh, constellations and different times of the year and how the sun sets at one time of the year in this place. And I made the observation a few years ago. We came home and it was, we live out in the country. And I told my wife, I said, I can see now how um, ancient mariners could guide themselves on the Mediterranean or seas by looking at the stars. Because if you pay attention to them and you watch, uh, and especially now I've got this camera that outside my house, and so if you run through it at night, you can just watch these things over and over, go through the same time of the year, the same night. And so when you look at the past, when you look at prophecy, you're looking at all of these oracles and all these verses, and when we look at the stars of the sky, it looks like, just this beautiful picture, but some of them are billions and billions of light years beyond the others. Others are closer, but we see this one panorama, this one picture. And in the same way, the words of the prophet, when we, when we read the words of the prophet, they have an application to the near, to the moment that they're in. They apply to the people of Israel. They also had a tense in which they applied to the future in the first coming of Jesus. Now that's going to be the focus of, of uh, verse verse 6 that we're going to be looking at. So it's going to be talking about the, the near future where in the time of the coming of Christ, about six or 700 years after this was written, I'll tell you what's interesting about the, the, the book of Isaiah. There was a day when Pastor and I, when we were in college and people were casting doubt about the veracity and the truthfulness of, of uh, books like Isaiah and saying, well, it was edited over a series of years and, and different contributors, you know, and it was by, written by human hands and such and forth. And it's interesting now that we've examined the Dead Sea Scrolls. I don't know if you've ever heard, but, but a set of scrolls found in the 1960s contains almost the entire book of Isaiah written about two or 300 years before the time of Christ. That's, that's it, it, word for word what we have in the Masoretic text of what we relied on for most of our translations. And so it's a reliable word, it's, it's trustworthy, but he had something to say back then. That's why it was so precious to them. And even though two or three hundred years before the time of Christ, they still valued it in, in their temple worship and all that they were doing. And so there was a sense and it had a, it had a context. There were oracles, there were judgments, there were warnings. And, but again, as you go through and you read Isaiah, there was a, a tense in which it talked about Jesus. How can you not see when in chapter 7 and verse 14 it says, For the Lord himself will, shall go and give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall come and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. How can you not see? That's Jesus. And over and over again in this book we see these high water places and then you get to Isaiah 53 and you read about the suffering servant and you read about the death that would, it would come to Jesus. And, and so there's a sense in which it applied to the first coming of Jesus, but it also has application to us today. So there's a tense in which it's to the immediate present right now for us today. The days that we're living in, you, you think about what's going on, not just here in our country, but around the world. Lord, what are you up to? What's going on? What's happening? We, we need you. We, we need your direction in our life. And Lord, I know you're up to something. Show us. And then ultimately it has a tense in which it applies to the end of the age, to not only the second coming of Christ, but the fulfillment of all prophecy and the consummation of this age and, uh, and into glory. And so 
prophecy is not just based on, it's not just a bunch of predictions. You know, a lot of people want to get it out and say, well, I'm, I'm going to give you some dates and I'm going to give you some, you know, we want to call out things the way. Prophecy is not based on predictions. It's based on God's promises. It's based on his person and, and who he is. And so as we read these tenses, we're, all this is mingled here. And so our focus, as Pastor said, is going to be those titles that's given in verse 6. And so in, the, in these moments that we have remaining, I want to look at, at verse 6 because uh, the, the Bible says, he shall be called. There, there's four names. Now, if you go there into the original language, and there's not a bunch of commas there. Some, there's some say, well, he'd be called wonderful, and he'd be called counselor. For me in this study, I'm going to take it where it's meant to be a modifier, where it's wonderful counselor, where it's, it's, it's pulled together there. And then in the next three studies, we'll look at these, uh, these other titles. But notice uh, that earlier prophecy in chapter 7, verse 14, it said that the virgin will bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Here, uh, it's he shall be called. Uh, He he will be recognized. He will be known as these names. This is who he will be. And the first one here that we have before us is this phrase, wonderful counselor. And so the the word wonderful there means more than just amazing or it means more than just good. It, it, it's, it's astonishing, something incomprehensible, uh, something that we, we, it's inexplicable. And so it's beyond our ability to conceive. And, and then the counsel means to advise or to give direction to or to give purpose to. And combined, when you think about what Jesus did, now let's go back and think about his ministry when he came that first time in his earthly ministry. Was this not one of the marks of Jesus, when you read through the Gospels, that people were just amazed. They were astonished from the time he was a child, from the time he was younger, and as he started his ministry, over and over again, he was not just a wise teacher. He was a, he was a miracle worker. There's so many miracles in the Bible. In fact, one of the Gospel writers said there's so many more that, that I couldn't even begin to write all about it. He healed physically. He healed emotionally. He healed spiritual sickness. He showed that he had the authority to go much deeper, though, than the flesh. He could forgive sin. And it ultimately, it pointed to the fact that he came to be a redeemer. He performed miracles to show that he had power over death to remind people that he was the one that was the author and was an agent of creation. And all of this remind us that Jesus is a wonderful counselor. And then the ultimate miracle was he kept talking about over and over again was I'm going to die and three days later I'm going to come back. The ultimate miracle is his resurrection. And just like Martha, who came when the brother Lazarus had died. Martha was a portrait of humanity. And Lord, if only you had been here, this would not have happened to us. And yet resurrection and life was the answer to their their questioning. Over and over again, we're reminded that Jesus is the God-man that came. That came not just as a child in a manger, but he was God himself, the perfect God-man. And so he came and he showed us the way home. He showed us his, his power, that he was a wonderful counselor. And, and, and not only that, but as we think about the teachings of Jesus. Now, I remember when I was a, a kid, uh, I'm going through some of the things. My, my parents have passed away in the last year, my, my uh, dad a few months back, my mother about a little over a year ago. And I'm going through the things. And I, I thank God for the biblical counsel. I didn't have perfect parents, but they guided me toward a perfect Savior. And I'm grateful for the instruction in the Word of God. I, and some of the things I treasure most are pull, and pulling out of their things. I'm kind of the, the administrator, the executor of their estate. And just going through old boxes and seeing how, how they brought us constantly to vacation Bible school and Sunday school and the Bibles that they'd given us over the years that pointed to a perfect Savior, that Jesus is our true helper. Jesus is our source of strength, and he is our wonderful counselor. And, and regardless of what happens with this 
pandemic and where we wind up, he will continue to be the wonderful counselor. If we have to keep doing videos and, and distance uh, instruction, that's all right. We're going to keep pointing people to the Savior and trusting that he's going to continue to save and make a difference in their life. You, you think about what God did through Jesus Christ. You go back and you read about the ancient so-called gods of the day. Uh, what did they do? In their view, they crushed uh, people. Um, in my mission work, I've been uh, privileged to travel to places all around the world, different continents, and uh, I've seen what uh, the effects of other religions and the places that we've been. Uh, religion's not new. People have, have been practicing religion for thousands and thousands of years. What amazes me that most places that I go have something, that they know something of sacrifice. In fact, most of the time it's, it's human sacrifice. It, it's the offering of something because they know that things are not right with the omnipotent, the all-powerful one. And most of the time it's, the, it's by offering a person, a human. And what a beautiful story of where God said, I'm going to be the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. To, to set everything right with you. What, it, it's, it's unfathomable. When I come to this time of the year and we start singing these great songs, every year it just hits me all over again how marvelous, how wonderful the story of what God did through Jesus Christ. It defies understanding that, that God himself would come down and would become flesh and would give himself as a sacrifice for us. The solution would be an infant born in a manger who would give his life, even though, as Israel did in this day, even though they stood against him, even though they're rebellious. You may have somebody in your life, in your family, you may have a neighbor that you think, I don't know that they'll ever come to God, or I don't know that they'll ever turn to God. Friend, God gave his son Jesus, and, and it may be that, that neighbor, that friend, that family member, this may be the year that God touches their heart. God may use you during this season of the year to invite them to a place where they can hear about the Savior. And it could be that this is the year that that story begins to touch their heart and the Holy Spirit of God begins to confront them with their need for a Savior. When I think about Jesus being a wonderful counselor, it's not just that he takes and gives me advice, but he shows me the way to heaven. He shows me the way home. He shows me of my need for God. And he shows me that even though I rejected him through his shed blood, he has accepted me and I'm able to come boldly before the throne of God and, and, and grace. When I, when I think about all this, I'm reminded of that old hymn uh, and, and I had to type the words up because my memory these days is, is not what it used to be. But uh, I, I want to I wanna close with the words of this hymn and it goes something like this. The hymn writer was, was going through a difficult time and so he just sort of penned these words. He said, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No one else could heal all the soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet, no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he's not near us. I'm so grateful for that. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. And then the chorus of that song goes, Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like a lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. And wherever you're watching today, I'm trusting, I'm hoping, I'm praying that you know him as a personal Savior through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you do, that you'll discover that closeness that comes from having a, a wonderful counselor, a friend that's as close as your, as your prayer right now, wherever you're at, he's there with you. And maybe you've never had a time in your life where you've reached out to him and invited him and asked him to be your Savior. Maybe you can do that during these moments. Would you bow your head in prayer with me? Lord, I want to thank you again for the closeness that comes through 
your son Jesus Christ. And Lord, through the struggles and the difficulties that we have in life, uh, I want to thank you, Lord, for, the, for your presence and for being a wonderful counselor to us. Lord, it continually blows my mind the things that, that you have done in my life. Uh, Lord, the times that you have taken my feet that have, that have strayed from your path. And Lord, you, through your grace and through your calling and through your conviction, you, you brought me home. And thank you, Lord, for your, for, for your unfailing love for us. Thank you, Lord, for the plan of salvation by sending your son, Jesus Christ, by giving hope not only to me, not only to these that are listening, but to our world. God, would you lay on our heart this time of the year someone who doesn't know you? And Lord, that maybe we've, we've just struggled to think that there would ever be a time where they would turn from the darkness of their life. And Lord, Lord would you help us to share not only your love, but share this message of hope that through Jesus there is hope and there is forgiveness. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for being our friend and our, and our, and our guide. In Jesus' name we pray. kind of not just sharing from the names of Christ but to kind of set things in context and uh, and for the next uh, four weeks we've asked that uh, brother Ernest would come and share our study and and unpack this passage and help us to come to even a greater appreciation of the Christ we gather to worship not just on Christmas but each and every day this is who Jesus has come to be and desires to be in our life. Let me encourage you this coming Sunday. I hope you can come join us. We'll be having our, our 8.30 worship service and our 11 o'clock worship service with uh, Sunday school at 9.45. And, uh, and then in the evenings, we are going to have our Bible club for our children and our youth group is going to be meeting this week. And uh, this coming Sunday... I hope to begin a series of messages in which we're going to begin to unpack some of the presents of Christmas that make a difference in our life day by day. We want to thank you for joining us, and we want to pray that God would continue to bless and lead in these days in your life and in your home and in your family. Is there special needs or concerns that you might want to share with us here that we could pray with you about, please don't hesitate to give us a call at the church and uh, or on my cell phone, many of you have that. Uh, or you can go to our church website through which many of you are watching this and know how to contact us. May God bless you in this day. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>